Hey there, welcome to another episode of Mundane Designs. This one's a special kind of hell because I've been tagged and I have to tell you my top 10 favorite video games in order. So let's start this off by explaining what this is. Um, I have to pick out of my whole collection. It's not that big, um, but you know, I'm, I'm closing in on 2000 physical games. Um, and I haven't even inventoried my steam games on my PC. Uh, <clears throat> but I have to go through everything that I've owned, played, borrowed, whatever and find not only do i have to find my top 10 that uh, of of all time my favorite top 10 but i have to put them in order i have to put them in order <sighs> this circus was started by mikey 78 yep retro mikey he uh my, retro mikey 78 started this whole mess and I learned about it because Retro Rivals got called out. But it's a special kind of call out. He doesn't, you don't get to call out channels. You have to call out individual people. So Retro Mikey, he got both Jen and Scott. And that to me was hilarious. Until I realized that part of the challenge was both Jen and Scott also had to tag five people. And I got worried. And Scott, you know, Scott hit, did his. They were, they were good choices. And I dodged. I dodged the bullet there. And Jen did hers. And if you've ever watched them do their streaming, you might figure out that I kind of harp on Jen for keeping up with the comments and stuff. And I figured this might be her way to give a dig back at me. But no, it, it didn't happen. I, uh, I dodged that one as well. And, uh, you know, I watched the people that they tagged and when their videos came out. Um, and I kept dodging and dodging and dodging. But I knew it was coming. I knew I couldn't, I couldn't do, I couldn't last forever. I just knew. Uh, <clears throat> so along comes my fellow Alabamian easygoing gaming. Dodge this. Yeah. He got me. I might have been his first call out. Who knows? But I knew it was coming, so I started prepping and going through lists and lists of games and swapping things around and figuring out what order and what deserved to be on the list and what didn't deserve to be on the list and, and all the honorable mentions and stuff. And I got through all of that. And then I started what I thought was going to be the easy part of the process. My five people to call out. I was wrong. Boy, was I ever wrong about this. I'm going to read you guys some of my tags that, uh, well, they got taken from me before I could make this video. Well, kind of. Ken's game collection. Well, um, I realized that he's doing a top 25, so nope. Uh, Iowa Retro Gamer Dad. Yeah. Someone already named him. 
like, I know, someone from across the pond that no one's ever going to do it because they can barely say his name, myself included. Girl Adino plays. Oh, thanks, Dennis. Fine. You know what? Someone else mentioned a twofer channel and I'll get a twofer channel and I, I like these guys and I think they're great is I'm going to get West from gaming off the grid and I'm going to get Robert from white gaming off the grid. Oh, what do you mean? Someone already got both of them. Thanks, Samantha. So this off into the wind, off into the wind. It was so hard to even just come up with the tags. But this late in the game, that starts to become the true challenge because you have more time to deal with what games you're going to select and less time and less opportunity to tag the people you want to tag. That's okay. Got a few tricks up my sleeve. It'll be just fine. So, my first tag is a little bit special because he thinks he's safe. He thinks he's been hiding. He thinks because He's trying to be part of the PC master race that he can avoid being called out. But Alex from Retro Rivals, guess what? You've been tagged. I know it was you, Fredo. You broke my heart. And I'm pretty sure that I can convince your mom to force you to do this. Number two, great person, very happy to have helped him with a few of his intros that he's going to be using sometime next year. Oh yeah, you know it, the old ass retro gamer. And another one I'm going to tag, great guy, a little bit far away from me, but you know what? He's still here, and he's still part of the community, retro-obsessed. And another person from up in Canada land, uh, it's going to be the retro lectors. I have a feeling there's going to be more than one Dreamcast title in there. And finally, I'm going to call out Captain Natron, I'm trying to get you out of retirement, man. I want you to come back and do a YouTube video or two. Not saying you have to go full bore, but I'd like to see you back here. And those are my five picks, my five tags. And you know what? I think that every one of you guys should be doing it. So, uh, I'm actually going to go over my honorable mentions and I'm probably going to have to just like read the card and stuff, uh, because there's so many of them, uh, cyberpunk 2077, uh, guys, the game's good over 200 hours into it. And that has to say something Hades, uh, you know, the little indie game that could, um, Forza Horizon series. Yep, the whole series. Aerial Blasters on the TurboGrafx 16. Here's one that's a little controversial. Might get a couple of boos. Chrono Trigger is an honorable mention. Halo 3 ODST is an honorable mention. Radiant Silver Gun is an honorable mention. Ouch, I know. Steel Battalion. The Guilty Gear series. Spy Hunter, starting on the PlayStation 2. The first one's actually my favorite of the Spy Hunter series um, on the PlayStation 2. 
Life Force on the NES, Metal Gear Solid, and the Overlord series. These are all honorable mentions. These are great games. I had a lot of fun with them, but they didn't make the top 10. And once you start seeing the top 10, I think you might understand why. Number 10. Number 10 on my list is not a shock that it's on the list. But I think some people might be shocked on its placement on the list. It's uh, from the NES, and it is The Guardian Legend. This game is a wonderful shmup and also a wonderful action RPG. I've talked about this game multiple, multiple times. Um, Everyone who knows me knows that I have a special attachment to this game that is outside of the game itself, and that does give me some nostalgia for it, but the gameplay itself is excellent. I, I really do wish more people would experience this game for themselves just to see what Nintendo could, what a NES could do back then, um, and how you could have a hybrid of two separate genres come together and make a beautiful game that is smooth and technical and makes you think about what you're doing and where you've been and what you need to do next. But yeah, that's my number 10. Number nine. Number nine on my list is a game that I can close my eyes and hear the opening soundtrack and I get chills and goosebumps all over. It is a haunting melody and probably one of the best PlayStation 1 games I've ever played in my life and that's Chrono Cross Um, I know that there are people out there that think Chrono Trigger was the absolute epic part of everything but I you know if Chrono Trigger was the mountain then Chrono Cross was the person on the hang glider jumping off of the cliff and sailing off into unknown territory. It was unbelievably good for me and uh, the storyline and how, how things just completely twist and turn around and uh, the real hard choices that you make and how you feel like you almost feel gutted even after you think you've made the right decision because of the consequences for uh, others that did not benefit from your decision. And uh, and the New Game Plus, oh my god, I was so much into New Game Plus that it was just ridiculous. and. I mean, that game took up my time for for months. Um, like, I want to say I like after the I, I got it day one when it came out, and I played and played and played and played and played that game. And I, I want to say I probably went through it like anywhere from like six to eight times when it was new and um it's it's so gripping to me that i'm almost scared to go back and play it again number eight number eight is a really great game that helped me discover the rest of its 
uh, series and it it made me a huge fan of the entire series and I I'm so thankful that I played this one game that pulled me into some of the previous games and made me a fan for the rest of my life and that's Ratchet and Clank more specifically Ratchet and Clank Future Tools of Destruction this game is unbelievable and I know I use that word a lot but the slapstick comedy um, that harkens back to like old Warner Brothers and old WB stuff and how it just uh, it clicks it everything just mashes together perfectly where you have a little bit of fright because you don't want to lose you don't want to get shot and you don't want to start over on certain things and the hilarity of like using the sheepinator or my favorite weapon mr zircon or any of the other like absolutely absurd attacks that you can make your opponent suffer through it's 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 a little bit of a sadistic humor where you're torturing your enemies but they kind of deserve it and there's not really any arguing against that you know dr nefarious is nefarious i mean it's in his name so it, it was just a, a great series for me to sink my teeth into and go back and play some of the earlier games uh, on the PlayStation 2 but um, yeah that was it was such a great eye-opener for me and it let me see uh, partially what the PlayStation 3 was capable of number seven some people would call my number seven a bit of a guilty pleasure and while I can see that, I'm not really in that category. Uh, I'm proud to have this as my number seven, and I don't regret saying it at all. It's Dragon's Crown. I own multiple copies of this game. I got lucky once and got a PlayStation TV out of a trade with uh, Captain Natron, and uh, I picked up Dragon's Crown uh, digitally first and then I tracked down a physical copy and uh, and then I tracked down a PlayStation 3 copy and then I got the PlayStation 4 Steelbook Edition on top of everything else so uh, yeah I love this game it yes I, I know I get it the artwork is very cheesecake. Uh, you know, you, you you can say all you want about the artwork, but the, Mage's Tower. the game plays beautifully, and it has still to this day has a decent online presence and community. And you can run around and run into someone from Japan that's like way way high level and uh, recruit them as an NPC later and uh, I mean go through download the game it goes on sale all the time look past the visuals and see how the game feels it's a side-scrolling action RPG beat em up and trust me the games got it where it counts number six so my number six is a game that honestly not a lot of people talk about um, I mean I, I know that this game has its own community trust me it definitely has its own community and that it has its fans that are diehard all the way to this day <clears throat> but uh, I have a different connection to this game uh, 
this game was around when all of my friends were headed off to college in different directions and um i mean they weren't too far away but uh you know it would have been a two-hour trip one way uh just to hang out for a couple of hours and then two hours back home and the game in question is fantasy star online episode one and two on the gamecube uh this game kept me and my friends all connected when there was no other way for us to stay that connected we we all loved the game individually and uh when we realized that you know we were going to be spending like more than a fair share of time apart from each other uh we didn't like that idea so what we did was we all agreed to come together on a specific night and you know at a specific time and play and you know create a a, a lobby that had a specific name with a uh, password that we all knew and we came together uh, under that banner in this game and yeah we beat the game man we beat the game multiple times we beat the game with multiple combinations of characters and all of this other stuff and geared every everyone up out to be maximum but uh it was more of a vehicle of being together with my friends than anything else now the game is awesome even standalone i would still play this game and and like not have any qualms about it whatsoever i love the music i love the visuals i love the magic system i love the combat system um i love the character creator i love everything about the game but the thing that really drove it home for me was the community that me and my friends had built amongst each other around this game so that we could still be in touch with each other. Number five. Number five is probably going to be a shocker for some people because it's such a modern game. Um, you know, lately I've been talking about NES games and uh, in my honorable mentions there are uh, SNES games. Um, Jen even made a joke that I might, uh, you know, uh, have an Atari game, you know, in uh, Atari 2600 game in my top 10 list. But no, um, you know, I, this game was just a huge shock to my system when I first played it that first opening scene when you're just swinging through new york city and that's right people i'm talking about spider-man on the playstation 4 marvel's spider-man on the playstation 4. i got chills i got chills i had to pause the game and set the controller down after the second swing because the the fidelity, the the way that you feel when you are playing as Spider-Man in the game, I think it's the closest I'm ever going to get to actually Hello? feeling Parker, like being a superhero. And it just draws you in, and it uh, yes. wraps you up in this whole world, in this great story. And you just, you can't escape it. It is all-encompassing. It, it has the music. It, it has the stakes. It, everything is high stakes for you as Spider-Man. You have to get these things done. Otherwise, people will get hurt. And so, you have your motivation that not only is instilled in the character Spider-Man, it's instilled in the player as well where you know what you have to get done and your goals align with the characters. And I mean, that is a wild, wild ride. And 
it was, I want to say, the second PlayStation 4 game I had ever played. And, you know, yeah, I've, I've played other games that got really, really close to getting me there. Uh, like the, the Batman series got me very close and, and stuff. But there's just something about how you can just swing through the city and pull off the acrobatics and have that feeling like the only thing that was missing was a fan that would magically turn on when I was swinging between buildings and stuff and then turn off when I was walking around. And I, I mean, it was almost like sensory overload. I almost could not handle that game. It was so good. And guys, this is not my number one on the list. So, you know, we're we're in for a bigger ride here. Number four. So my number four game is actually uh, the first PlayStation 4 game that I've ever played. And uh, I have my friend Sinchatus to thank for that. Um, he's the one who's doing the voiceover for the uh, the graphic you know, number coming at you and stuff like that. And thank you for that, Sinchatus. I, I really do appreciate it. Um, but uh, it was Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, I knew that this game existed. I didn't quite know what it was, but I was actually collecting PlayStation 4 games before I actually had a PlayStation 4. If I saw a game that looked interesting or I saw the reviews and videos and stuff like that, I would buy it ahead of time, and usually I'd probably buy it on the cheap, like anywhere from five to ten dollars, just depending on uh, what I could scoop up at the time. And this is one of those games that I got before I actually end the system, and so I was very eager to play it, <clears throat> especially when it was being uh, given such high praise from a good friend. And so I I turned around and decided to play it first, and. I didn't regret it. Um, it was, uh, it was beautiful. It was stunning. It, uh, everything was just so well put together. It was like they had this seed of a story and you get to watch it bloom and grow into this beautiful game that had everything around it just perfectly crafted and there's like layers upon layers of story of like why do things look the way they do why do people say names the way they do uh how there are different cultures within the game and how you can interact with them and stuff like that and I have to say this game made me grow as a gamer uh, this game does not hand you anything you have to earn it you have to take it uh, you know nothing is completely out of your grasp if if you want to go kill one of the Thunderbirds and be extraordinarily under leveled but you as a player have the skill to pull it off guess what the game's going to let you. It's not going to make it easy for you by any means, but it's possible. Almost nothing in this game is impossible. And that level of freedom and stuff really spoke to me. And uh, I, I call this game like one of the epic beauties of the PlayStation 4 and playing it again on my 4K television it rings true um, you know I've, I've compared this to watch it, like watching uh, the racehorse Sea, sea Biscuit run uh, there were sportscasters that were talking about how they couldn't understand why they were crying when they were watching that horse win the Triple Crown and 
one of the sports people figured it out. I was like, because you're watching perfection. And yes, to this, to me, this game approaches perfection. Uh, even more so than Spider-Man. And that's saying a whole lot. Uh, I still can't believe how many people have not either heard of this game or have not played this game. And it, it almost wrenches at me. It almost makes me want to buy copies on the cheap when I can. Like if I find copies for $2, I'm probably gonna start buying up copies of this game and giving them to people who have never played this before, just so that they can go through and have such a good, enjoyable experience. Number three. So my number three in my top 10 list is actually a game that is on a lot of other people's lists and they were really interested in seeing where this game lands on other people's lists. And mine lands on number three. The game is Castlevania Symphony of the Night. This is another one of those games where it was kind of like a water cooler game in high school for me and my friends. Uh, we would get together and talk about strategies on how to beat certain bosses. We would talk about uh, what familiar we had equipped and why. Uh, we would talk about what equipment we were using. We would talk about what our favorite spell was to cast in the game and uh, even our favorite music in the in the soundtrack and uh, mine of which is Bloody Tears. And, you know, I, I love the music, I love the aesthetics of the game, I love the going back and forth and backtracking and making sure that you have the right items. Um, my favorite spell was uh, Soul Steel. Uh, everyone else had their specialty, Tetra Spirit, they had, uh, you know, Dark Metamorphosis and various other things like that. But I like Soul Steel because it was a huge amount of damage and you got to heal yourself. But it wasn't the easiest spell to pull off, so I had to spend a lot of time practicing. Um, you know, the, the equipment, uh, my friend Sinchatus, he loved Chrysogrim uh, because you could run and slice and... Uh, what is your business? Yeah, I was a cheesemonger. I I've used the this. shield rod and the alucard so shield. Um, because uh, I felt I me playing as Alucard, I was going to have no mercy for my enemies, and this was probably the best way to kill every single one of them. But, you know, again, everyone, or quite a few people actually have this game on their list, and a lot of people are curious on where it lands and with me it's it lands on number three guys number two so we're getting close we're uh we're down to the final two here and i have to say uh you guys might not be expecting what you're going to see and what you're going to hear but here we go let's start this off my number two is Final Fantasy Tactics on the PlayStation 1. This game got me back into gaming. I had dropped out of gaming and had, uh, you know, wandered off doing other things and uh, didn't have a PlayStation, but I went over to a friend's house and spent the night and uh, hung out with him and had a lot of fun and everything. and he had a PlayStation and he had Final Fantasy Tactics and I remember waking up before my friend 
and turning his PlayStation 1 on and continued playing that game, I played that game for hours. And he sat there and watched and uh, gave me some pointers and it wasn't just him watching me play a game, it was uh, again uh, like a community type thing where he was helping me learn how to play and what to do and how to defend and what maneuvers to make and stuff and that game made me get a PlayStation 1 and got me back into gaming after I had a short stint of going away from it and I'll never regret it um, you know I uh, I love the music the combat is awesome. The the stages are great. The graphics still hold up to this day. Uh, you know, they didn't do too, anything too far out of the box that would age poorly. Uh, they've remade the game multiple, multiple times. And there are rumors that we're going to get another Final Fantasy Tactics. I hope it's a new title. But honestly, I would accept a remake as well. Um, but yeah, I just, I cannot get enough of that game. I have gone back and replayed it over and over and over again. And it just never gets old to me. Number one. So, here we are. My number one game. Some of you might have a guess of what this could be. I've kind of hinted at it a little bit in some of the previous mentions. You know, just little hints. Some might have picked up on it, some might not have. It's a PlayStation 1 game. It, uh, had great influence on me. Um, it uh, it was very upbeat when there were other RPGs that were way too gloom and doom. You didn't have to save the world. All you had to do was worry about joining the Adventurers Guild and earning your spot. That game is Grandia on the PlayStation 1. It is my top tier number one RPG, JRPG of all time. The combat where you're moving around and, and I mean like everything works. The music isn't too far over the top to distract you from the other elements of the game. The visuals aged well. The combat system is a masterwork. Um, the the story is starts off innocent, for lack of a better word, and grows up as the main character grows up as he is no longer a child he does put away childish things and moves on and becomes a man and you get to help him through all of this and yes spoiler alert you do get to eventually save the world that does get shouldered onto you but you uh you start off innocent you start off as a child and and that innocence and that excitement and everything else builds on you and it's such a palate cleanser um from 
Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VIII, Final Fantasy IX, where the world is constantly in peril and you're the only person who can save it. This takes a simple idea and connects it to the next one, and then connects it to the next one, and that idea connects to the next one, and things start to spread and spiral out and become more entangled. Uh, things become more complex and you start seeing other people's motivations. You don't only get, you know, your blinders on to only what the main character is looking at. Eventually you, you have to deal with other people's motivations and even, uh, stop their goals to you know start to save the world and stuff and it's it's just I guess I it was such again a such a shock to my system because i was used to saving the world i would pop in a jrpg and i would think okay how are we going to save the world this time tonight brain um <laughs> so it was just everything that fell into place and I guess it was part of um, how it hit me at the right time where I was just tired of saving the world straight out of the gate and playing a JRPG where the main character was motivated to be a great adventurer and join the adventurers guild and have fun while doing it was a great change of pace for me and it was just something i needed at that time i you know it, i just i needed that that joy that release of of all the gloom and doom and just something happy and that's what this gave me, and that's definitely why it's on my number one. Uh, I mean, the story, the music, the visuals, uh, the the character development, um, and and just how well they put everything together. I'm not so sure any game will ever take my number one slot from Grandia. And that's the end of the top 10, guys. Uh, I really want to thank you for sitting through all of this with me and uh, taking the time to learn what I consider my personal top 10 video games of all time. And um, I, I don't know. I really don't know if I have anything else to say about it other than this is my top 10. Um, if... Uh, you know if you can disagree with what I've said um, but it's just my opinion uh, you know just just like easygoing gaming said you know and and I hope that my top 10 changes I hope that this does not stay concrete um, I want it to change I want developers to come out and force me to change my top 10 of all time and I hope this happens to you as well so that uh, these these companies are making the effort to leave a everlasting impression on you um, you know and I, I really just uh, you know want to thank everyone who has participated in this I know it's been hard on anyone who's been shouted out on this and that it's going to be hard for anyone that's going to be shouted out um, Oh, yeah, there's one more thing, and it's it's kind of like digging at me in my back, and uh, it, it, it's a spoon. Huh. Oh, there's an engraving on it. Um, easy, property of easy going gaming. Huh. But why a spoon? Why a spoon, cousin? Why not a Access. Because it's dull, you twit. It'll hurt more. Well, that's it for this episode of Mondane Designs. I'm your host, Mondane, 
and I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed making it. I have videos on the 1st and 15th of every month and look forward to sharing them with you. As always, please like, comment, and subscribe, and have a wonderful day.